introduced me. My name is Griffins Mamuro. I was part of the IRTP program 2014-2015. Um, and now I work as a senior program officer in the Women's Health Innovations team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm based in the Seattle office and I have been with the Gates Foundation for the last, uh, from January this year. So that's around 11 months now. I'm happy to meet you all. And I know there are quite a number of familiar faces in the audience. And in case I'm not clear, or if uh, there's somebody told me that I tend to mumble. So in case I'm mumbling, please tell me. In case I'm not told well enough. <laughs> uh, so I thought that I would take like um, a minute to just show you my career journey so far. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I initially began as a medical doctor in the Ministry of Health, and I worked in Homer Bay District Hospital, Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital. Um, and then after that, I joined the University of Washington Research Group as a research physician. And at, at that time, I was working at the Mombasa Women's Health Project. And this is basically a clinical research site that's dedicated to high-quality uh, clinical research on women's health issues. And uh, yeah, so our studies included influential research, clinical trials, cohort studies, and all the kinds of research. And then I came to UW for my MPH, and uh, as part of the MPH program, um, was also an IRTP fellow or an IRTP scholar. And then I went back and I had worked in research and I was now interested in a bit of the programmatic experience. So I um, joined the FHI 360 as a senior technical advisor. Um, and this, this is a four-year USID-funded program. We were basically providing HIV, STI prevention services to sex workers, men who have sex with men and people who inject drugs. Um, and then after that, I also joined Jilinde, which was led by Japaigo. And uh, at that time, this was the second largest prep scaler program. And at that time, we worked with Irene and uh, when she was at NASCO uh, and several other people. And we basically were catalyzing prep scaler uh, for people who are on um, who are an ongoing high risk of HIV. And then after that, I joined the International Center for Reproductive Health Care. And I was telling Kerry today that I initially started as a clinician, got into research, and then from research, I thought it was interesting to get into program, program implementation program. And then one of the things that got me interested in ICRH was to tie down the three, the clinical, the research, and the programmatic in a leadership position. So working with budgets, working with people, uh, high-level engagement uh, with the um, governments, and so on and so forth. So at ICRH, I began as a deputy director, office director, and then in 2019, I became country director. At that time, I also started my PhD, or was doing my PhD at Ghent University. Uh, and so I worked in ICRH for four years up to the end of last year. And then uh, in January this year, I joined the foundation. Um, at ICRH, we did a lot of Gates funded programs. And that's how I also got to know about uh, Gates Foundation and Gates people. And uh, most of our work at that time was in family planning. So initially, I also started working in uh, HIV and sexually transmitted infections. Then at some point, moved to PrEP uh, and adolescent girls, HIV and STIs. And then over the last four years at ICRH and now at the Gates Foundation, mostly it's on family planning research. So that's pretty much my sort of journey so far. Um, I, I think it's been an exciting journey. Yesterday on Monday, we had dinner with Lukoya Toli. Some I don't know if some of you know him, but he's also he's been a really good mentor all through. And before that, uh, maybe three months back, we had dinner with. Walter Jaoko and John Kinuthia. Mm -hmm. So it's been a good time having dinner with mentors. And we were saying that well, if you get a mentor, you don't let them go. You just tie yourself to their hips. And, <laughs> and that's how life goes on. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so part of what I've also been able to gain all through is really good mentorship from all these people. And yeah, good. So, uh, I thought I'd also give you a very brief overview of the Women's Health Innovations team at the Gates Foundation. So we fall under the Gender Equality Division, and there are multiple divisions at the foundations. Uh, the Gender Equality Division is one of the newest divisions, um, and the idea is to work with partners to take risks in new areas, uh, prove concepts, and bring ideas to scale. 
The G division aims to achieve gender equality by empowering women and girls. Um, and so in the gender equality, we have several teams. And uh, so some of the teams are focused on health issues, some are focused on non-health issues, and some are focused on a combination of both. But the idea is all these people should work together to achieve gender equality by empowering women and girls. Um, so we have the women's health innovations that I'll talk a bit more about. Uh, we have the family planning team, uh, maternal, newborn, child health, and then there's the maternal, newborn, child health discovery and tools. So all these teams are focused on health issues that empower women and girls. And then we have the gender data and insights and women in leadership. Again, these are teams that are sort of now in the transition area between health and non-health. So gender data and insights collects data and learning on gender related issues. And so even the women's health innovation and family planning data management falls under the gender data and insights. And then women in leadership is women in leadership, but there's a focus on health leadership. So training leaders in health training, but specifically building the capacity of women leadership. And the main reason for that is because they found that even in research, you have quite a number of research assistants who are female and then at the transition between um, middle level leadership and leadership leadership is sort of not very favorable to women. So you have very many women working in research and clinical service delivery, but not as many of them transcend to that level of absolute leadership. Um, and that's one of the, that's one of the areas of interest for the gender equality team. And then down there we have areas of digital connectivity, women's economic empowerment gender integration and gender norms and learning agenda. So a lot of the lower parts or the lower teams are still new and are still uh, at the proof of concept level, uh, trying to figure out whether this is something that is needed at that level or not. Uh, but these are the teams in the gender equality division and I work in the women's health innovations team. Um, in the gender equality division. And each of this is led by a director and then uh, everybody else falls under that. Um, so our approach to women's health. So we, our goal is to improve women and girls' health at every stage of their lives. And we do this by focusing on areas that affect women and girls disproportionately, differently or specifically. So we are interested in things that affect women disproportionately or things that affect women differently or things that affect women specifically. I think the, the, the one thing with women's health that uh, many people have, don't consider is that the things that affect women don't kill them, but they make them sad for a longer time. So something like endometriosis is not really a very huge cause of death. Something like dysmenorrhea or pain during menstrual pain doesn't kill women, but it makes it's a very huge source of discomfort. Um, and so when you look at the disability adjusted life years, or if you look at the global burden of disease, many of the women's health issues don't figure so much prominently at the top because most, most of the time we were very interested in things that kill rather than things that bring discomfort. And so one of the things the Women's Health Innovations team wants to do is to look at all these things that affect women that don't necessarily contribute so much to dialysis and to deaths, but that still contribute significantly to problems with women's health. Uh, and so if you look at the life course of women, uh, ideally the vulnerability often reduces over time. So you have the first uh, sexual um, First, if the first sexual intercourse. So, I mean, so you have menarche first, uh, which is the first time they experience the monthly periods. Uh, you have quite a number of things that are associated with menarche, or you have a number of vulnerabilities that are associated with menarche. Um, so, you have all this increased risk of infections, higher sexual behavior, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's in blue at the top. And then you go down and you have Koitak, which is the first time or first sexual intercourse. Of course, there are quite a number of things or vulnerabilities that women face after their first sexual intercourse. So you have a higher risk of getting HIV. In, in Kenya, for example, you have a much higher risk of infection for women than men. 
Um, then you have sexually transmitted infections and their sequela and so on and so forth. And then the third thing, after uh, initiating sex, you have a uh, period or reproductive health period. Uh, and here you have so many other vulnerabilities associated with this. So you have unintended pregnancy, you have reduced agency over reproductive choices. There are many women who, for example, don't have uh, or don't have such a huge autonomy over the kind of decisions they make, the number of children they have, when they have the children, who they have the children with, how they have the children. These are decisions that quite a number of women in many parts of the world don't know or don't have the option to make that, those kind of decisions. And then, of course, associated with this, you'd have some, some of the negative health outcomes, uh, poor maternal and neonatal conditions, I mean, outcomes. Uh, and then also we have uh, maternal morbidity and mortality. I think we're looking at data from Kenya again, and the maternal mortality is, is not as low as we expect. Um, we would expect that as of 2023, we still we should be having better numbers for maternal mortality. Um, and so a lot of these things contribute to that mortality. But the one thing to consider and to understand is not all women's health conditions kill. There are many that are still associated with many other adverse life outcomes that if we are only looking at morbidity and mortality, then we might miss them out. Um, so what, what do we do specifically? There's, there's a lot that we do uh, in the women's health innovations, uh, but we make investments, uh, which are grants, across the value chain to improve access to women's health interventions. And we do this with support from other teams at the foundation. So we don't carry out research per se. Uh, we don't write protocols to ethics review committee and collect data, but we fund ideas. And we also discuss with principal investigators on how to shape ideas um, so that we can improve, so that we can go towards a certain direction with women's health. Uh, so our research and development work is focused on three main areas right now. Uh, so one is contraceptive technology, and here we aim to get more women included or get more women on family planning. I think if you looked at the latest data, we have about 120 million um, unmet family planning needs. And many of the times or many of the reasons that FP needs are unmet is because sometimes women can't get the ideal kind of methods they want in addition to, of course, access to the currently existing methods. And so under contraceptive technology, we are looking at non-hormonal methods. Um, and this is a purely, or this is a fairly new field. Uh, and then we have long-acting self-injectable. The current DMPA or Depo-Provera is about three months. We are looking at the possibility of six months or 12 monthly injections. Uh, microarray patches are an area of interest, and this is a mode of drug delivery. Um, I think you can find, you can think of the uh, smokers patch or the nicotine patch. So trying to deliver uh, contraceptive using such a patch, um, which precludes the need for an injection, makes it a much more comfortable form of administration, um, and hopefully has a better drug delivery since you're delivering it in a better place. And then we are thinking of a monthly oral. So this is an oral contraceptive drug that's taken monthly, stays in your stomach for at least 28 days. Um, and that helps, especially for women who want to use an oral drug, but don't like taking drugs daily. Uh, and then the second area we're working in is in STI. So we have vaccines, diagnostics, and treatment. So vaccines, uh, we're thinking of uh, HPV vaccine, chlamydia vaccine, gonococcal vaccine, syphilis vaccine, and I'll talk uh, I'll talk more about this in the next slides. Diagnostics we're talking about uh, for point of care diagnostics for sexually transmitted infections. These are non-HIV sexually transmitted infections. So when I say STIs, uh, this precludes HIV because there's a separate team that there's a HIV team uh, that does HIV. And then treatment, so these are newer treatments for non-HIV sexually transmitted infections. And then the third is gynecology and menstrual health. So here we're looking at the vaginal microbiome, bacterial vaginosis, uh, but also menstrual health. So um, coming up with the newer recyclable uh, menstrual health products, 
but then also just seeing how we can uh, carry out more research on menstrual health and how that can inform how we can develop other women's health products. So that's for research and development. But the second area we also do is user insight and market analytics and product introduction and market access. So here we try to under, to get user insights on and market data. And right now this section is focused mostly on family planning, just given that FP is the oldest in the women's health portfolio. But we also hope to do the same for all these other three, STIs and gynecology and menstrual health. We are looking at commodity financing and procurement global. So we, our team also supports the UNFPA global supply chain group uh, that does forecasting and delivery of family planning products for uh, LMICs. Uh, We're looking at su supplying security for injectables and implants. So one of the things that uh, I always get surprised is that there's only one company globally that makes the injections for Depo Provera. So if this company, for example, either closes or if they say they're no longer interested or it's no longer profitable, then we would have problems with Depo. So last year, the foundation invested some money to increase production, a separate production line in India for the BD inject, the injection for Depo Provera. Uh, and then, of course, there's supply chain, and then there's product introduction. Something that's of interest down there is ecosystem strengthening. So one of the things that we notice the research uh, talent ecosystem for family planning, HIV, and STIs is um, there's a need to build research capacity for women, for young investigators, and for investigators in low- and middle-income countries. And so we are also investing a lot to build the research uh, environment. So training researchers, networking researchers, coming up with trainings and fellowships for research leadership, uh, targeting these three groups of people so that we can have, um, I think for the HIV world, it's a lot representative, but for family planning uh, research, it's very, very skewed towards the global north. And there are very few researchers currently on FP um from low and middle income countries and it would be important to get researchers and research people who have lived experience and have a better understanding of the context uh, joining the table as well so this ecosystem strengthening is something that's uh, quite um, of interest and at the end of my presentation i'll also present on a, on a current grant opportunity uh, from the women's health innovations team we have 24 grants open for up to 150,000. Um, and it would be interesting if there are people within this group who are interested in applying or who are interested in putting forth applications, <laughs> um, that would be interesting. But that's that's my last, that's uh, my last or my second last slide. So anyway, so today's talk was on sexually transmitted infections and I'll take maybe five or so minutes or 10 minutes to talk about STIs and what we do specifically on STIs. Uh, non-HIV STIs. So first thing is there's really limited data on the burden of sexually transmitted infections. Uh, there's little burden on the clinical and socioeconomic impact on women's health. So right now with the UDAP start group, we, uh, and that group also includes Scott, are working on a project to just understand the burden of sexually transmitted infections and infertility and the cost of this. Uh, so what are the economic costs, mental health costs, and general cost of sexually transmitted infections in women? And that idea is to bring, to advocate for greater interest on um, and, and funding on STIs. Uh, right now, the global estimates of the prevalence of sexually transmitted infections and the resulting DALIs, they suggest that the burden of STI is relatively low, but there's a lot of uncertainty on the global burden of STIs. We've never really done a pan-STI study for the whole world. Um, and so most of the data on STIs come from small studies that have been done, but there really isn't um, really comprehensive data on sort of uh, the burden of STIs. Uh, interestingly, STIs account for about 0.34% of disability adjusted life years globally. And in sub-Saharan Africa, this can be as high as 1%. It's as significant as measles, for example. And so that's just how significant sexually transmitted infections are, much as they're not getting as much attention and funding and, and interest as they should be. 
In terms of uh, DALI, safety is <laughs> the most significant driver, and this is because of its effect on bad outcomes among children. Um, and in contrast, the most common STIs are genital herpes, streak, and chlamydia. Uh, these are the most common um, non-HIV STIs. 87% uh, of the total DALIs are in LMICs, 72% um, are in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and about 14 countries make up about 80% of the burden um, in low- and middle-income countries. Again, I, this could be because of the distribution but it could also be due to the fact that some countries have zero data on STIs. And so we could underestimate the prevalence and the impact of STIs in certain countries just because the data is fairly sparse. Um, but then in many African countries, STIs are most common in women than in men. They're also most common in key populations, but they're also common in adolescent girls, which is a population that we haven't focused so much on. And, uh, Yes, so in terms of uh, understanding STIs, the, the whole STI in adolescent girls is, is an area that hasn't been as explored as it's supposed to be. Uh, just something small on the impact of sexually transmitted infections. Uh, so we know that STI is a major contributor to HIV. Um, of course, HSV, syphilis, and gonococcal infections have been shown to um, be common uh, when it comes to HIV. Um, quite a number of new HIV infections are attributed to sexually transmitted infections. Um, and I think with decreasing, I mean, with, with increased access to PrEP, <coughs> viral suppression of HIV of, uh, from ART, uh, there might be increasing condom use, and this might also contribute significantly to increased STI infections. Uh, but other than HIV infections, STIs are also associated poor reproductive and birth outcomes. About 26% of women with untreated syphilis will have a still birth or will have a fetal loss. Again, this is something that's not quantified and is not very explored so much. Uh, quite a number of pregnancy losses in low and middle income countries are and can be attributed to sexually transmitted infections. This, this is an area where data is missing. And one of the questions we had was how we could design a study to just look at the effect of sexually transmitted infections on adverse pregnancy outcomes, uh, or the effect of sexually transmitted infections on infertility. That's sort of a complex study to design because it would take a bit long um, and probably would be expensive, but it's not out of question. Um, we've had a couple of calls with including Scott and I think quite a number of people within the um, within UDA, but. Uh, it's, it's a study that, I mean, it, it's thinking that's ongoing, um, but it would be interesting to get a lot more data on this and, and have a really strong uh, justification, for example, for increasing funding on STI research and STI treatment. Um, so I'll go through this first. Uh, and of course, right now, the most common way of managing STIs is syndromic management. And this is where patients are presumptively treatment, treated based on the symptoms. Uh, for low and middle income countries, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the most common method because we, we adopted syndromic management in the 1970s and 80s when the rates were very high and uh, it offered the advantages of treating the infection at the first visit itself. Uh, it reduces reduced complications and we didn't really need lab diagnostics for STIs. And this was easy to integrate to the primary healthcare system. Uh, but the problem with syndromic management, uh, as you can see, is that most STIs are symptomatic. So if we are to treat based on symptoms, then many, many, many people, especially women who have STIs, are not treated because they are not screened. And so what happens is that you have long-term sequela, you have poor pregnancy outcomes. Um, and so it's really important to begin a lab-based or diagnostic-based screening for sexually transmitted infections. So there's a study in Uganda that found that uh, the sensitivity of clinically indicative symptoms for chlamydia and gonorrhea was somewhere between 40 and 50%. So basically, 50% of women who will report a symptom of an STI will not have, and 50% of those who say, for example, uh, who are okay and have no symptoms have an STI. Um, so the ability to detect and treat is low and makes it uh, difficult to manage STIs. 
Um, so as you can see there, uh, there are quite a number of missed cases due to syndromic management, and this results in adverse outcomes for most of these conditions. But the problem number two is many women who come and say that they have a vaginal discharge, for example, and you treat them for an STI, will not have an STI, or they will not have the STI for which you treat them. And so what results is a certain form of overtreatment, and with overtreatment, there's also the possibility of antimicrobial resistance. So in 2023, or sometime maybe over the last couple of years, there's been really high uh, advocacy activities to develop cheap, affordable, available point of care diagnostics for STIs and avail these diagnostics to uh, especially uh, resource constrained settings so that we can have uh, better management of uh, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, I'll skip this uh, because I'm seeing we have um, less time. So one of the things that we have engaged in uh, as a as a way of developing point of care diagnostics for sexually transmitted infections was to look at who's working on STI diagnostics. And these are doing a landscaping of all the organizations, startups, bio biotech companies that are working on STIs, and then trying to see who can be supported to catalyze the development of the point of care diagnostics for STDs. Uh, but before we did that, uh, we also worked with the World Health Organization and a couple of partners to develop what you call a target product profile uh, for an, an ideal uh, STI diagnostic. Uh, so for TT, TPP, we are looking at the uh, desirable and achievable characteristics of the test, and then we use this to guide the development uh, of these point of care tests. So for example, the goal of the test is to detect, this is an example of a TT, T, TTP for uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, intended use and target population here, we want to use it for sexually active people, um, target use and setting, we want to use it in a healthcare setting, especially at primary care level or above, uh, but we also are exploring the option of availing, the, of availing these tests in private pharmacies and for use at home uh, as, as part of self-testing at home. Uh, the equipment, uh, the results, how do you read the results? And so the results seem to be clear, positive, uh, and so on. And so this, the, the, the table on the right is an example of a TPP. This is basically a wish list for a diagnostic that you want to make. And then this is what we give to the biomedical companies and they use this to develop the point of care test. Uh, and a really critical part of the TPP is the cost. So ideally the test should be less than $5 per test. And if it can go as low as a dollar or $2 per test, then it makes it easier to use this um, in uh, especially sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so this is an example of some of the point of care diagnostics that we have for STIs. These are tests that are ongoing. Um, I think they're almost done right now. So the first one is a small instrument that uh, the platform itself is a small instrument. It's a disposable ca cassette uh, and it's a reusable instrument. So if you look at the top there, you have that black box, that small black box is the test itself. It's a nucleic acid amplification test. Uh, and then the clear thing on top is the place where you put the swab itself. Uh, so this test is designed to detect active infection. Uh, and we have platforms for syphilis, chlamydia, and uh, gonorrhea, and trick vaginalis. Uh, the test can do multiple tests, so you can insert you can insert one swab and have it run tests for all four uh, infections, or you can put a panel that just tests one. So there are many ways of playing around with it, but eventually we want to have that kind of test, and you can dip. Uh, one swab and then it can do a pan STI test and tell you whether you're positive for all, positive for one, for two, for three, and so on and so forth. So it can ideally, even at, at the end of development, it should be able to run multiple analytes. Um, so there are various tests that we are currently working on. There's one test that is going to be for testing uh, chlamydia, Neisseria gonorrhea, and trick vaginalis. Uh, there's another test that's going to be a pan genital uh, ulcer disease panel. So we'll have HSV, both one and two, syphilis, uh, MPOX, chancroid, and varicella. 
Uh, and then we have a third test that's going to be used for uh, the um, active diagnosis, I mean, diagnosis of active syphilis. The current challenge with syphilis is that most of the tests are unable to detect between uh, active and past infection because they're antibody tests. Um, and so for you to do or to differentiate between past and present infections, you have to run multiple tests, um, what they call treponemal and non-treponemal tests. What this test does is that it's just going to be a very simple test for detecting active syphilis. It's fairly difficult to design um, a test for syphilis diagnosis, and it's been a while in the making, uh, but hopefully all these tests, the three tests for aptitude CTMG, aptitude GUD, and ETAP syphilis, all those three tests should be ready within um, the, the next maybe six months, um, and then we we'll begin clinical trials um, to see how they perform against the standard tests. And then beyond that, we we'll need to begin thinking about how to do product introduction and uh, how they can be mainstreamed uh, into the current uh, patient management. So yeah, so uh, the last one is that at this year's Grand Challenges meeting, the Women's Health Innovations put up an RFP um, and we are looking for innovations and ideas that address opportunities uh, outlined in the Women's Health Innovation Opportunity Map. And I can share the opportunity map later. Or you can also just have a look at the Grand Challenges website and uh, look at the kind of opportunities that are available. Uh, there, are ones in the, that, there are ones that are available. So we are considering projects and proposals that uh, have up to a total of 150,000 over two years. They are open to everyone, uh, non-profit organizations, for-profit companies, international organizations, government agencies, and everyone. And uh, of course, we encourage applications for projects that are led by women from women-led organizations. Uh, but of course, this is not limiting applications to female um, investigators only. It's open to all kinds of investigators. Uh, and the other thing is also to, uh, we encourage collaborations with the, uh, various people. So we encourage you know, um, teams to collaborate across disciplines and across institutes. Uh, and the deadline for application is uh, on December 6th. Uh, so thanks very much. I think that's the end of my presentation. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take